It's been a very good day and good music and thank you all so very much. It's one of those days as well where there's still better things yet to come. Today I want to talk about God can't be fooled. God can't be fooled. This series of things that God can't do. And, uh, you know, I think by the time we get done, there's going to be, I don't know, 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 of them, whatever it is, but, uh, that God can't do. And God can't be fooled. Folks, we live in evil times. If we think we're fooling God, boy, have we got a wake-up call coming. We're living in evil times. <clears throat> Just picking up a few things the last couple of weeks off of the news <clears throat> gives you an idea of that. I'm still appalled over the one where the mother and two of her friends wrapped two small children in a blanket and beat one of them to death. Um, if that's not evil, I can't imagine evil. So what did they get beat for? Stealing food. Now I don't know if anyone else took note of the motel room whenever they showed it. I counted at least four big boxes of cereal plus other chips and stuff and we beat a child to death over food. Remember, Action Ministry needs help today. They try to keep kids from being hungry. It's very important. Uh, the night they had one on the news you may have seen, I thought, well, that was pretty stupid. Um, a guy beats his grandmother so bad that she's taken away in the life squad, and whenever the policeman said anything to him, you know what he said? Well, she deserved it. She deserved it. Yeah, how nuts can people be? You know, no offense if anyone's that stupid. That's just stupid. And then to tell the policeman how yeah, she deserved it. Recently we had one on the news where a man shot and killed his best friends because he took my drugs. This past week we've had bomb threats, schools closing because of those threats. Folks, evil's everywhere. And we're living in very evil times. And if we think we're fooling God, we're the ones who are fooled. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers come, will come scoffing and following, following their own evil desires. So if you're doing your bulletin, desires. Follow their own evil desires. Well, if we're not living in a world that's following its own evil desires, and I'm not trying to make up your ma mind about the bathroom issue, but the part that concerns me is that point of 1%, there's three tenths of 1% that is making the law for all the rest of us. Does that bother anyone? There's something wrong with this. We are living in evil days. We're living in days where the moral decline of our country is showing over and again. That's just one area that it's showing. And it's a very difficult time for all of us. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 will say this. But mark this. The apostles making it very clear to young Timothy. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Any of that sound familiar? If you've watched the news lately, it all sounds familiar. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Now get this, have nothing to do with them. Have nothing to do with them. Denying God's power. All of these things are transpiring. Now what, what's it saying right here at the end? Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Well, we have a form of godliness because if you watch the evening news, it seems that they're very quick to point out to us, well, this person was a member of that church, or this person was a member of that church. And that's a form of godliness. So many times, uh, ones who are sitting in the pews, it's showing a form of godliness, and we think, because I'm sitting in that pew, because I'm in church on Sunday, because I wear the name Christian, I've got everyone fooled. Well, folks, they don't. 
They don't. And they certainly don't have God fooled. So, even as Christians, we speak evil, we criticize, there's backbiting. And we think God doesn't know. God cannot be fooled. God cannot be fooled because I sit in church or because I'm the drug dealer on the street. God cannot be fooled. So, number one, don't be confused. God can't tolerate evil. God cannot tolerate evil. Over in Romans chapter 1 verses 18 and 19, it says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godliness. Against all the godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness since they may be known about God and is plain to them because God has made it plain. In other words, we can know all about God. We can know all about God. But see what it's telling us? The wrath of God is going to, to be revealed against those. It's going to be revealed against those because they're trying to deceive themselves and to deceive others. They suppress the truth. They don't want to know the truth. Folks, this evil time that we're living in shouldn't be taken lightly. And it shouldn't be taken lightly by the church. We as the body of believers should realize that there's a, a power that we have and we call it prayer, but we cannot be confused by good and evil. Now we were talking about this not long ago, perhaps in Bible study a couple of Wednesday nights ago. Have you noticed that we tolerate a lot more than we used to? There's things that are coming on our TVs that we tolerate that used to would have got a producer fired and today we tolerate it? So we as the church must be able to cleanse ourselves of the evil that surrounds us and find the strength that is only in God. And if we find that strength that is in God, we can make a, a notable stand for Christianity and for the world and for our God. But we've got to be able to do that. And to do that, we have to know his word. We have to know that he is not going to tolerate the evil that is around him. God can't tolerate it. He's made that aware the actions and the remarks that, that hurt other people, that drag people down and away from God. Ephesians chapter six, or chapter five, verses uh, six and seven will say this. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. God's wrath will come on those who are disobedient. And he says, don't be their partner. Don't join forces with them. Don't accept what they are doing. Make it well known. God's wrath is on the disobedient. Well, now some will instantly come back and say, you know, there's a lot of disobedience out there and I don't see God doing much about it. You ever hear this? He's going to get the last word. Trust me, it's coming. It may not happen as that disobedience happens. Let's do a little comparison. Whenever you were a teenager, John, and you got a little ornery. <laughs> oh, that wasn't John. Kenny. I, I don't know who it was. Uh huh. And you was a teenager, you got just a little ornery. And you went home, and dad and mom didn't know it yet. What did you do? Whew. Took a sigh of relief, didn't you, John? Uh huh. Yeah, we took a sigh of relief. Because we thought. They weren't going to find out. And then you give it just a little while. Looks like we're in the clear. All is well. And you give it just a little bit longer. And you start looking for your car keys and you can't find them. You all know where I'm going with that, right? All of a sudden the reality starts to set in. It's no different with God. You may think that you've slid through it, that you've got by it, that it's going to be okay. And lo and behold, there it is. So it may not get you right here. But God's not going to tolerate it, folks. He's just not going to tolerate evil, and he says he can't. 
He's not going to let it happen. So as I look around and as I listen to the news, I've come to the conclusion that we're living in very tough times because there's evil that is everywhere. Evil that is everywhere. From a few months back, our sign was defaced out front. And it was terrible what was put on it. Right here in Latonia, downtown Latonia. And at that time, the sign was staying on all night. So someone did it out there in the bright light of the sign and defaced our sign. Well, fortunately, Dale got over there and started scraping right away because it was terrible right here. Now, as times changed since you was a kid, whenever you was a kid, you wouldn't even throw rocks at the building, church building, were you? Now, you know, I, I used to have to mow the little Methodist church down there in the country. I mowed behind their building and I was always afraid to go back there because they had this cubicle on the back of our building. Some of you may remember them. An old country building had this cubicle on the back. Well, one of the other kids, you got to remember, I didn't go to church. One of the other kids told me that was God's room. I hated to mow back there. I thought, what if I disturb him? Uh, and I, was, I wasn't a very big kid. What if I disturb him? So there was times the back didn't always get mowed. No, we were pretty respectful. Haven't we seen that disappear in our world today? All around us? Everywhere we go? So if we think there's no evil, we're wrong. But now what about those, all of us who have been involved in some type of evil? Don't be unrepentant. We have a gracious and a loving and forgiving God. A God who wants to put his arms about you and embrace you. A God who wants to include you into his very family and invite you around his table. But God has made it very clear. Repent or perish. Repent or perish. See, God can't allow evil to go unpunished. God cannot allow it to go unpunished. 2 Thessalonians, if you would turn to that. In 2 Thessalonians, um, it is going to say this. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Uh, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out of the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Everlasting destruction. Now, for me, that everlasting destruction, that's something that everyone would know. We've all got this idea of what everlasting destruction is. We are kind of raised with the idea of heaven and hell. Every one of us has had that, whether you were in church or whether or not, heaven and hell. And we think that's coming at the last days. In the last days after we die, we think that we're either going to be rewarded with heaven or we may be amongst the very, very few that are going to be lost. At least that's what we have in our mind. So we have those feelings. But the part about that verse that, that worries me more than anything else is this part where it says, those who do not obey God will be separated from him, shut out of his presence. Now we might interpret that to think that it starts once we die. But let me suggest to you that it starts when you're unrepentant. You don't have to die. You can be shut out of God's presence if you are unrepentant and you've removed yourself from him. God didn't move, you have. Now sometimes whenever we think, I'm not being blessed. I'm having a tough time. I'm not feeling any blessings here, Lord. Do you ever think that maybe it's you that has moved away from his presence and you are the one who has shut yourself away from him instead of him shutting you out? You have shut yourself out because you have not been receptive to his words? Now repentance is something that we all have to do. There's not a single one here. The scripture says that we have all sinned and that we all fall short. There's not a single one of us here who haven't had to humble ourselves and go before God and say, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. And then we may have got up and did it again. But hopefully you're persistent. And you go back and say, I messed up. 
I stumbled. I fell. Man, I didn't just fall. I ran smack dab into it. And then we go back and say, forgive me. Now there's something special about our God that he accepts our repentance. We don't always accept each other's repentance. We should. The scripture says that we should. But we don't always accept each other's repentance. But we do have a God who accepts our repentance. And then we're not shut out of his presence. Now folks, if you believe that there is a veil of sin between you and God, your day's miserable. You have a miserable day. If you believe that there is some type of wall between you and God, you have put yourself in a position where you're saying, I can live without him, and that's not what you're wanting to do. You're really wanting to find a way back close to him because you are Christians. And each one of you have tasted of the glory of God at some point in your life. Today we're going to have a couple baptisms. I'd like to tell you it's because of this sermon, but they told me ahead of time. If you guys would have waited to tell me, I would have said it was because of this sermon. But, all right. Now why are they going to do that? They're going to put themselves in the presence of God and whenever we enter that watery grave, whenever we're resurrected, that brand new person, you can't tell me that that's not a wonderful experience. For all of us who have had it, we probably remember when it transpired, when it took place, and we say, amen. That's good stuff. So why can we think just because a few years pass that we're not interested in that same type of blessing, that same type of contact, that same type of acceptance from God that we had that day? I want all of you who, who have made that decision already, I want you to go back to that day when, when you made that decision. Man, it was powerful. You really felt close. And whenever the leadership of the church took you to the back, and I hope they did, and they sat down with you around the table, and one of the elders would say, now this cup represents the blood of Christ, and this loaf represents his body, and you're sitting there ready to partake. You can't tell me that you don't feel like you're around God's table. This isn't Latonia Christian's table. Nope, our name's not on it. It's not our table. It's his table. And his table. I didn't invite you to come and take communion today. He did. He invited you to be around his table. To do this in remembrance of him. So whenever we come around that table... It should be that renewal because of a repentant heart. I hope none of you take communion without saying, Father, forgive me. There's been things this week that I shouldn't have done. And I want to renew. I want to be refreshed. Help me. Every one of us should be there. So our God can't allow evil to go unpunished. Now sometimes that evil continues in us. Sometimes that evil continues to be there. In, in uh, Romans it will say in chapter 2 it's going to say this in verses 8 and 9. But for those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every, every human being who does evil. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Okay, now let's go back to it. I want you to make sure you don't miss it. There will be trouble. There will be distress. For every human being who does evil, those things are going to happen. Do you ever feel the distressed? Ever feel so distressed about all that's going on? Make sure it's not your own evil that is distressing you. 
But God says he will bless those. Trouble and stress for everyone who does evil. So, where should we go with this? Don't be deceived. God cannot be fooled. God cannot be fooled. Romans chapter 2 verse 16. This will take place on the day when God judges people secret through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. Folks, let me make it simple. God knows your secrets. Now, I may not know your secrets. I know some of them. They're safe. So for all of you who are looking around, don't look around. They're safe. But God knows your secrets. He knows some of those secrets that you haven't even shared with me. He knows your secrets. We all have them. Those secrets may be because of issues or burdens or past sins. But we all have them. We have those secrets that we've hoped tucked away that we hope will never come out. And maybe, just maybe we will be blessed because of our repentant heart and we will never have to face the consequences of those secrets. I sure hope that's the case for me. I hope it's the case for you too. But sometimes we do. But everyone has them, even those that no one knows. Now, do not think you are keeping them secret from God. He already knows. He's aware. You know that thing you did? To, he knows it. And he's waiting for you to come and sit down with him. And sit down with him. Do you ever have to go to the principal's office? I never did either. Uh, so. <laughs> I can remember so many years ago, I got invited to the principal's office. It was an invitation. And they didn't give me a choice, but I had to go. And I sat down and he's looking me in the eye and he goes, you really want to know what this is too. But he goes, did you really do that? Our school had cameras, so I'm pretty sure he knew I really did do it. So I'm thinking, Maybe I should say, that was someone who looked like me. <laughs> he said, did you really do that? I thought, you know, number one, I've already been invited to the principal's office without any choice. It was an invitation that had to be answered. Obviously, there's two or three of my buddies sitting out in the hall. They got here first. They're still here. Maybe I need to say, yes, I did do that. And see where things went. Well, that's exactly what I did. I said, Mr. Smith, I really did do that. And he looked me in the eye and said, that was really pretty good. He said, I would have never thought of it when I was a kid. But two of your buddies are going home because they lied to me. The rest of you go back to class. I thought, woo, good time to be honest. <laughs> now, you want to know what it was? Okay. You remember when the 1969 or 70 Volkswagen come out and it had that bumper that stuck way out in front like that? One day, during study hall, <laughs> Two or three boys and I decided we were going to study auto mechanics. And we went out and took that bumper off and put it on this side of a steel pole and his car on this side of a steel pole and put that bumper back on. <laughs> now see, I, th I was like you. I thought that was really good. <laughs> you thought it was really going to be something bad, wasn't it? <laughs> you ought to have seen us out there taking that bumper off to get that car off that steel pole. That was the rest of it. God knows if you put the bumper on the other side of the steel pole, folks. He's just waiting for you to come in and admit, Father, I really did do it. I really did do it. And he's shaking his head and going, I know. 
this is the 10th time this month. <laughs> and he says, I know. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and I'm going to close with this. I like this verse, and you're going to get it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us for all unrighteousness. Amen. He is faithful. He is just. He will forgive me. But not without me asking. Not without me asking. Have you talked to him? Or are you thinking, he knows I'm in church. I've got him fooled. Folks, God cannot be fooled. God cannot be fooled. Have you asked him? I hope that you have and I encourage you to ask him today. I encourage you to make this the first day of the rest of your life where you start out or close your day, however it might be. God, I, I need your help. I am weak, but you are strong. Help me. Will you all please stand as we have our invitation.
that you repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. And I take him as my Savior. And I take him as my Savior. Amen. Okay, Samantha, if you would stand right up here. I told Samantha her grandpa would be so proud of her. Earl was such a faithful uh, part of Latonia Christian Church here and just uh, so knowledgeable, he and his mother, of, the, of God's Word. And, and we're so proud that you're taking this. Uh, and it, it's the right time to do it. You know, we are so proud of you. And if you would repeat after me. I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. I take him as my Savior. And I take him as my Savior. Amen. Amen.